Kicking off our list at number 10, Israel Cursed Tomb. Here we go, right off the hop. A secret tomb was discovered in Israel only a month ago. Now this is the first time a tomb has been found at the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 65 years. Now the actual cave itself was discovered only a year ago, but these smaller chambers are being found recently, as like a month ago recently. And the tomb found came along with a message. Awesome, we love those. It vows to curse anybody who would open the grave, and this message is also written in blood red, so yeah. Can we not open this one, maybe? Last time we had a black sarcophagus in Egypt, people were sticking their heads in for no reason, just to see what's up. And then, you know, a plague happened, so. Number nine, Polish King Curse. Some of you may remember this, or your parents might so ask them about this at dinner. Yeah, make it weird tonight. Ask them about a Polish King Curse tonight while you're eating food. Back in 1973, a team of archeologists were jazzed when they uncovered an ancient 15th century tomb. The tomb of the Polish king of the time, King Casimir IV Jagiellon. Now media was of course all over this discovery, as they should be, it was exciting. Now everyone was of course making jokes about a curse. You kinda have to, right? We're all thinking about it. What if there's a curse? I don't know. Open it though, still. Some team members involved ended up dying after the discovery, it was a little odd. There were a few who said it was due to a curse, but the sudden illnesses were in fact caused by deadly fungi inside the tomb. So, it still was the tomb's fault, but it wasn't a curse per se. It was breathed in, and that's what led to these researchers' untimely death. Number eight, King Tut's curse. Here we go, since we're on the topic of illnesses or curses, let's go back 50 more years, shall we? To the legendary discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. This discovery is what made everyone, you know, so paranoid when that Polish king curse came out, right? This discovery and what followed is the main reason we believe in mummy curses today. One member of the expedition, George Herbert, passed away suddenly six weeks after they opened King Tut's chamber. It was not toxic mold, it wasn't a curse, but rather it was a mosquito bite on the cheek. He got blood poisoning from a mosquito bite, that's all it was. I mean, I'm sure digging up bodies from the past and opening the tombs up doesn't help karma in general, but it wasn't a curse written in red. Not this time. Number seven, a strange resting place. Ancient burial grounds, okay, these tombs, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Some can be these massive great pyramids, and others can be a shallow cave system. Sometimes there's ancient history right below your feet, and you'd never know. In St. Augustine, for example, the remains of a donkey were found buried underground. And judging from the skull and the bones and the placement, something was afoot here. It had clearly been hunted down by humans and placed there purposefully. That's not the mysterious part at all. The mysterious part is that all the bones have been carefully separated and there's no marks to suggest that any tools were used. So researchers believe that this thing wasn't even used for food. So what was it? The limbs were placed to point north and south. That's it, they used this donkey as a compass. How rude is that, what? Donkeys in that area of Florida in the 17th century, that's not bizarre at all. But the way the bones were buried, you know, north and south, that's very odd. That's very Game of thrones -y. know what I'm saying? What's the message here? What's the point? What's the point? Besides north and south, of course. Number six, tortoise tomb. Okay, somebody called Mario. We got a lot of shells to explain. Okay, pal? Back in 2005 in northern Israel, a tomb of a shaman, who we believe was a 45-year-old woman at the time of her passing, was found in a cave. It was a cave slash tomb. Like I said, many different shapes and sizes. There were 28 other skeletons as well, and it appears they had a six-stage burial. There were beautiful decorations to suggest such, but something that really stood out here were the you know, 86 tortoise bodies discovered in the corner of the tomb. What was, what was going on here? What did we miss? I have FOMO, but I'm not sure why. Was this an ancient feast or a long lost sacrifice? Either way, poor guys. In our number five spot today, we have the Faliron Delta Necropolis. In 2016, during the construction of a new library and opera house in Athens, Cruz accidentally stumbled upon this necropolis, which is a cemetery that is the final resting place of more than 1,500 citizens from ancient Greece. And while this is most definitely an eerie discovery and a reminder of our own morality, the horrifying discovery came when they found a small chamber within this one, and inside there were more than 80 skeletons that all had their hands shackled above their heads. How's that for a horrifying discovery? I don't know, I'm gonna say pretty good. 
Each of these skeletons belonged to people who died young and healthy, and while the exact cause of death is yet to be determined, all signs are pointing to some kind of mass execution. Right now, the best theory as to who these people may have been is that they may be some of the people who were a part of a coup in 632 BC that was led by Cylon against Athens. It's just strange that even after these people passed, they didn't unshackle them, but that might just be a mystery destined to stay a secret. In our number four spot today, we have the ancient curse. All right, so of course we have to have a good old fashioned curse that was unleashed from inside of a tomb. Okay, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but there really was a curse found on the inside of a tomb. This tomb was the tomb of a Pharaoh's official who was thought to have lived around 4,000 years ago during Egypt's sixth dynasty. It was an above ground tomb that was shaped like a rectangular box. Inside of the tomb, they found a curse inscribed that warned anyone who dared to disturb it. The curse, roughly translated, states anything a trespasser, quote, might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It then goes on to warn the trespasser of his knowledge of spells and secret magic, and it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. These kinds of curses have been found in other tombs, and while they certainly are nothing like the ones depicted in horror movies about mummies, it might still be a little unnerving to those unearthing this discovery. In our number three spot today, we have the Lothagam North Pillar Site. One of the most incredible archaeological finds in Kenya led to a... Well, it wasn't exactly a horrifying discovery, but it certainly was unexpected. Around 5,000 years ago, a tribe of herders paused by a lake in what is now Kenya in order to bury their dead. This ended up turning into one of the most massive and monumental construction projects Africa had ever seen, which is no easy feat. For 450 years, they dug into the bedrock, piled up slabs of sandstone, and buried their dead for generations with ritual ceremonies, and this led to what researchers now consider the earliest and largest monumental cemetery in Eastern Africa. Here's the one kind of unexpected thing that they found here at this site, though. Along with the bodies of those who had passed, researchers also found 405 gerbil teeth at the site. As it turns out, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this, and it's because they were used to make a headpiece for just one of those who had passed away. This site might not be as large and tall as some of the other monuments like the pyramids in Giza, but what makes them the most remarkable is that this site was made by the people for the people. Not for emperors or kings and queens, it was for tribe members of every age and gender buried alongside each other. In our number two spot today, we have the tomb of Hatshepsut. This was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, and she was the second historically confirmed female pharaoh. She was an incredibly interesting person who we really could talk about all day, but we are here talking about tombs, so let's cut to when hers was found and unearthed. There were a few interesting things found within her tomb, but the real horrors came after when they began to examine her remains. They were actually able to find a cause of death for her and can actually attribute it to something she possessed. They found benzoprene carcinogenic skin lotion with the pharaoh, and it is believed that this gave her bone cancer. It is likely that she poisoned herself accidentally while just trying to soothe her skin. Being diagnosed with something like that with the help of modern medicine is already a horrible and painful and scary thing. I couldn't even imagine having to go through it all these years ago without any kind of treatment. In our number one spot today, we have this ancient mystery. Okay, so this is one of the coolest things I've ever heard, and it has me rethinking my entire career. Maybe I do want to be an archaeologist after all. Basically, researchers have found a 1,300-year-old Chinese mystery, and where did they find it? In a Tomb Raider shaft. This feels like a Hollywood blockbuster, and somehow it's just real, ancient life. While excavating a tomb in China, the team discovered the skeleton of a young man that was riddled with wounds, giving clues as to how he died. The man is estimated to have been about 25 years old, and it is thought that he was harmed and then thrown into the Tomb Raider shaft while still alive, which is absolutely gruesome. It is believed this crime took place between 640 and 680 AD. It appears as though he wasn't a thief because the shaft had begun to be refilled with soil by the time of his death, so we really aren't sure why this young man met such a cruel fate. As a true crime enthusiast, this is absolutely fascinating, and I wish we could find some answers to bring this guy's story full circle. 
Sometimes, though, these things are just destined to stay a secret hidden in the past. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine, and in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it. A worshipped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles, again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets, now they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately, in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin, but in doing so, they got a little bit too excited, they didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. Involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot really. Let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact. That's a true fact right there. Those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three rows of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve-wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. 
That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue, really, at this point, was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time. Always check the pots. The name Paten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use this name, historically, was the long-lost queen, of Akhenaten. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh, let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Number five. The Sitting Man. Okay, of all the tombs to find, this one would be the most horrifying. This would be so jarring to stumble across, okay? Buckle up. Back in 2005, researchers found a Mayan tomb in Honduras from the fifth century, okay? It's a long time ago. And the body inside was not lying down. It wasn't a pile of bones pointing east or west this time. Rather, it was in a chair, sitting up like a villain from Zelda. How scary would that be? I mean, it's beautiful, but that's jarring to stumble across. You know what I mean? Whoever was the first person to look and see that, brave soul, that's all I'm saying. The body found, it appears to be an elite member of the Mayan empire. He passed away, we think around 650 AD. Yeah, the guy gets propped up in a chair. That's awesome. His legs were crossed and he was rocking jade jewelry. This was very royal. And the tomb itself was actually upright as well. It's common fear to be buried alive, but in this case, you'd have plenty of room. You'd be like, Oh, we're good. These types of tombs are actually quite rare to find, but the fact that this one is also in great condition and there's somebody sitting cross-legged inside, double rare. Here we go. Number four, the Terracotta Army. This is, I mean, talk about curses. Oh boy. The tomb of Emperor Qixi Huang, China's first emperor. Okay, in this tomb, we can find 8,000 statues. This one is quite loaded. I almost made this number one just out of principle. But they all have unique carvings on their face, as if to suggest these are all custom statues, all representing an individual from that long ago. All 8,000 of them. The emperor believed that after he had passed away, he would have the spirits of his enemies to face, so he wanted to be prepared even after death. The emperor decided to close the tomb before the workers even had a chance to get out. It was horrible. He was worried his enemies had found out. So there's of course lots of statues down there and a lot of dark history, just all piled into one. I would never go near this. I think the Mummy 3 is about this tomb. It didn't do so well, but yeah. Scary concept. Number three, message from Egyptian afterlife. We're all curious what happens after you die, of course, but nobody celebrated the end of your days like ancient Egyptians did, right? It's beautiful. Like I've mentioned before on this channel, they would have these fake painted doors. They would leave valuables. Any new tomb that we discover provides more hints as to what lies beyond, right? An ancient necropolis was discovered only a few years ago, again, in Egypt. It contains dozens of coffins and a necklace that holds a message from the afterlife. Okay, now we're talking. This site is around 2,000 years old and they're in the process of excavating it as we speak, slash as I mansplained to you about these tombs. But so far the tombs and artifacts found, officials think, belong to an ancient priestess. A message from the afterlife is pretty spectacular, but what does it say exactly? Well, we're still waiting to find out. These things take time, you know? Number two, mythical carvings. Back in 2014, a 1700 year old cemetery was discovered along the Silk Road, which are these ancient trade routes, ancient highways rather, connecting China and the Roman Empire. Now in the city of Kucha, now in Northwest China, the cemetery was found along with 10 ancient tombs, one of which was referred to as M3. M3 didn't have any haunting messages this time around, but it did contain several carvings of mythical creatures. Creatures that were once alive? Question mark. There's the white tiger of the west, the black turtle of the north, the vermilion bird of the south, so far so lovely, and then there's the azure dragon of the east. A little bigger, a little bit more mighty. These mythical carvings represent different seasons and the heavens, but could the other six carvings mean depictions of hell? Probably, possibly. 
And finally, number one, the Ring of Sekinianas. One ring to rule them all. And by rule, I mean curse you and your entire family. Don't touch this. This is why you don't steal from ancient tombs has to be number one. This 12 gram gold ring, for starters, looks beautiful. And secondly, it's massive. Its diameter was 25 millimeters, so unless you were wearing some sort of infinity gauntlet, it's probably gonna fall off your little Jack Skellington fingers, you know what I mean? The ring had first been found in 1785. A farmer was plowing a field in Silchester Village, a village west of London known for its grim history, because in 45 AD, ancient Romans invaded that site. And come the seventh century, it was completely abandoned and probably pretty cursed. The ring was mighty and even had an inscription on it, a Latin inscription, of course. It read, Senechian vivas in diem. And when 1929 rolled around, new details surfaced, or resurfaced, rather. The data from the ring matched an excavation that was done in the early 1900s, less than 100 miles away, in a place called Lydney. That's where this ring is from. At the same site, however, a tablet was found recalling the Celtic god of healing and hunting, and how his favorite ring, got stolen. Hmm, I'm connecting some stories here. Uh-oh, I may have stolen something I shouldn't have. If this rings a bell, yes, Lord of the Rings was inspired by this exact legend. The tablet also says, may he who bears the name of Senechianus not have health until he brings the ring back to the Temple of Nodens. Yeah, let's get that ring back ASAP Rocky. That would be great. I'll be a lot quicker than Lord of the Rings. I'll be a lot quicker than three movies. I'll tell you that. Where's this temple? I'll put it in my Uber right now. I'm on my way. Starting our list off at number 10, New Grange. Heading over to the beautiful Ireland, kicking off this list. New Grange is this massive circular tomb. It's an ancient mound, really, protruding from the earth. It's quite hard to miss. Now the tomb is roughly 5,200 years old, meaning that this passage tomb in the Boyne Valley is older than Stonehenge and older than the Great Pyramids of Giza. That's pretty incredible. Stone Age farmers built this mound somehow and is 85 meters in diameter and 13 meters high. Again, quite massive, hard to miss. A tomb that takes up an acre of space must be nice. Now the passage and main chamber just happen to align with the rising sun on the mornings around the winter solstice. And if that's not fancy enough for you, the tomb is surrounded in a ring of large curbstones. There's actually 97 curbstones that surround Newgrange in total. And some of these are engraved with megalithic art. They're probably one that says Todd was here, most likely. Number nine, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, of course, as you guessed, in the Valley of the Kings, but the name of the tomb is a number. What in the Elon Musk is happening? Who names their tomb a number? What? KV-52, that's the official name, and it was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and of course this one, KV-52, they all together form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Hidden underneath six feet of debris this entire time, the entrance to KV-52 was finally found. So when we enter a tomb that had been untouched ideally for thousands of years, we could find anything, right? In fact, whatever they do find is a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle of humans' history. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was pretty much empty, yeah, that's, that doesn't feel too nice. All this time, really, it's empty? There's no treasure, are we sure? Empty except for two boxes, both black and undecorated, which is a little ominous. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments. Number eight, Luxor Tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago quite often when we refer to these tombs, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time. But in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty. It was tucked away in Luxor, Egypt this whole time. We've missed it for so long. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty. Now, it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official of some sorts because Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt at the time and given how this tomb looked when we found it, yeah, they were pretty important. Officials believe that the tomb could have been used as a mass grave due to the large amounts of human remains found inside. Now, it's important to note that this tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that time, which was way later on, was found in the same tomb. Yeah, we're gonna find a spork in that tomb in 5,000 years and be like, ah oh, yes, more ancient tools. Number seven, ancient curse. When officials found the tomb of Ankhmahor, AKA a pharaoh official from 4,000 years ago, they also happened to find a curse. Yeah, for real, this one was written on the wall, right there, that's how you know that you're screwed. Buried in Mastaba, an above ground massive tomb held 
this warning. It reads, might do against this my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. And it also warns of Ankhmohor's knowledge of secret spells and magic. And it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts. So if you enter this tomb, your magic, you might see some ghosts. I don't know, I'd be out of there comedically fast. You would read that and then look down and my shoes would be left there, that's it. I would be gone, my shoes would be left. Like a cartoon. Number six. Celtic Warrior Shield. Now this one was referred to as the most important British Celtic art object of the millennium. So yeah, not a bad title, I guess. That's pretty cool. An ancient Iron Age chariot burial was discovered in Yorkshire a few years ago. And our researchers were actually excavating a house development in Pocklington. They didn't mean to find this, but then all of a sudden they find a soldier's tomb and they're like, all right, I guess that's lunch. Are we rich? I don't know. The soldier was laid on a chariot. It was beautiful, but he had a Celtic shield laid over top. Now this shield was also dated back to 175 BC. A lot of history, lots to unpack here in an accidental tomb finding. First of all, most Iron Age shields up until this point didn't have a scalloped edge, but for some reason, this one here did. We thought metal shields were only used for ceremony, but this one's been used in combat. It's been repaired and then used again, it seems. There are clear sword marks around the shield, each that tell a story. Yeah, let's just go poke around a Celtic warrior's tomb. What could possibly go wrong? Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archeologists discovered a 4,000 year old tomb from the 11th dynasty. Tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt. And officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital. So the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers next will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found. So when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, 
Well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's Hidden Chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archeologists but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go, we're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the Tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. 
Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Sure. Number five, the sitting man. Back in 2005, researchers found a Mayan tomb in Honduras dating to around 650 AD. And the body was not lying down, it was actually sitting upright in a chair. Yeah, again, I would run out of that tomb comedically fast. This man was an elite member of the Mayan Empire, it seemed. He had passed away around 650 AD, and his legs were crossed, and he was rocking J jewelry. It was a beautiful setup. The tomb had also been positioned upright, like I said, and these types of tombs, they're quite rare to find. But the fact that this one also had somebody occupying it, still sitting up, still cross-legged with their jewelry, that's beautiful. It's double rare. Usually people come in and grave rob. This is lovely. Would you ever walk into a tomb? Sound off below. This is a terrifying job. We have home funerals today that are kind of similar to this. I saw a post recently on Reddit where a guy, instead of an open casket, he was just sitting on the couch with his clothes on, like dead, as if he was still alive. And that's an interesting way to do a funeral. I don't know. It's kind of like ancient Egyptian, kind of terrifying. I don't know how I feel about it. Number four, Paris catacombs. Of course we have to mention these ones, so haunting. Have you seen As Above, So Below? Yeah, I'm never visiting this place. These catacombs date back to the late 1700s and they're literally full of bones. So it's no surprise that some entrances and compartments have been blocked off, ideally, hopefully, forever. The catacombs history is pretty twisted, it's pretty sick. When the city cemeteries were filling up, and I mean that in a literal sense, officials began moving bodies all over the city, just trying to spread them out, just off the roads, ideally, maybe, and hopefully to these abandoned mines. Eventually those started filling up and now we don't know what to do. But the catacombs did open in 1809, so eh, you know what? What a fun family excursion we have now. Let's go see the whole maze of bones. All these bodies that were occupying the land, they just stacked them up. Now it's a tourist attraction. I feel sick to my stomach. They designed the catacombs with the walls of skulls to ensure that visitors would meditate on the idea of death. Lovely, let's go home, I'm terrified. Number three, Poland double tomb. All right, here we go, two and one, time to get cozy. All around the world, there have been a handful of two-person tombs discovered. Now, this is the only one that they found in Poland, so pretty impressive, have to mention it. Back in 2015, archeologists discovered this 2,000-year-old necropolis that had been sitting there for centuries, just at peace. And then we came along with flashlights. Now we gotta open things up and lick rocks to see what year dates back to what and whose skull is whose, right? Whatever geologists do. Lo and behold, they were around 120 tombs in total. Yep, now they're all awake. Awesome, here you go. Enjoy your resting, we're here now. Now you're a museum. They were used from the first century AD to the third AD. Now among these 120 tombs were two, one, a two and one, that stood out. Tombs that archaeologists referred to as princely. Pre-war culture in Kujawi were in fact Celtic, so their burial process was also Celtic. Now, it's a little odd to see a Stone Age Celtic necropolis in Poland, so yeah, it's like history it just collapsed into one little ball, and then we found that ball, and we're like, oh, what's in here? A lot of spiders, and let's get rich. Number two, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. It was a six foot tall slab of pink granite and it was carved over 3,500 years ago. The door was found near Karnak, the door was found near a Karnak temple in Luxor and it originally belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hepshiput many, many moons ago. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official for over 20 years, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead, so that's why they're all over here. The actual slab of granite though, this door, it was found originally far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and somehow it ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Yeah, never thought I'd have to say this people, but don't steal doors from the dead. That guy for sure got cursed. Okay, and finally, number one, the Alexandria Black Tomb. Speaking of uh, curses, this one's pretty heavy. We found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria back in 2018. You probably remember this, right? And somebody thought it was a good idea poof, to open it up. 
and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. It was bones and sludge, and it smelled so bad everyone ran away. It was horrific. When archaeologists found this massive tomb, again, untouched for over 2,000 years, on one hand, sure, that's a great find. It's a fascinating discovery. Lovely. It's a feat in itself. But us humans, we're curious cats, right? We want to pop it open, see who or what is inside. What if it's Alexander the Great? What if it's treasure that they used to pay off everybody's student loans? Hey, who knows, right? Let's open it up. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted just a few centimeters before every official involved at the construction site fled the scene. Yeah, it smelled that bad. They had to run away. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this man put his entire head in the tomb later on to show us that it is safe and not cursed. I mean, you can use your hand, you know what I mean? You can do this. You don't have to pull your head in. You can just do the one hand thing. That works just as well. Maybe a foot, but straight to head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri. Watch the mummy. Don't do this. Kicking off the list at number 10, new tombs. Fresh off the press, folks. Egypt announced only yesterday. <laughs> Egypt, they announced it. Yeah, just all of them as a whole. Egypt announced only yesterday that they have discovered five ancient tombs in Saqqara. This is fresh news. This is brand new. Only a few people know about this. These tombs date back to the time of the Old Kingdom, around 2700 to 2200 BC. So yeah, they're a touch old. The five tombs were found northeast of the Pyramid of Mener, a sixth dynasty structure. Now these tombs clearly belong to a group of people with high value. They were obviously officials. Mustafa El Waziri, head of Egypt's Supreme Antiquities Council has since released additional information on who the tombs belong to. How fun is that? That's how fast we're getting to the bottom of this already. This happened like yesterday and we already know who's in the tombs? Okay, great work. The first one belonged to an ancient official named Irie. There's a deep burial shaft that leads down to a chamber filled with funerary decorations, offering tables, the seven oils. It looked completely untouched. Well, it was. And of course, there was also a limestone sarcophagus. Can't have a tomb without a sarcophagus or two. Number nine, Queen Nerit. Just over a year ago, the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities announced the discovery of Queen Nerit, the wife of one King Teddy. Yeah, here we go, AKA the first Pharaoh of Egypt's sixth dynasty. They found her burial shaft. There were coffins, of course, mummies, artifacts, all dating back to the new kingdom, meaning the Saqqara necropolis was used in the late period, but now apparently it was also used in the new kingdom as well. That's the news to us. Perhaps the most questionable find was a four meter long scroll. That was the 17th chapter of the Book of the Dead. Yeah, nothing like finding a chapter of your favorite book. You're like, ah, where's the rest? Let's find them. It's like a national treasure movie, only haunting. As well as funerary masks, miniature boats, and 50 coffins. A lot of coffins in this one. Again, this is the first time 3,000 year old coffins were found in the Saqqara necropolis. This is huge. Number eight, mummified lion cub. Back in 2019, Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb was released, and honestly, what a weekend that was. That was a good time, I remember that one. If you haven't checked it out, I implore you to do so. Officials discovered a 4,400 year old tomb that belonged to a man named Wache at the Saqqara Necropolis. This was pretty close to Cairo, only 30 kilometers away, so you can only imagine this commute ages ago and how beautiful it must have been. This tomb was full of incredible artifacts, mummified animals even. There was a lion cub and over 3,000 ancient artifacts. A lot of stuff, jam packed this one. When digging up our past, it's tricky because you don't wanna ruin any funerary decorations and anything like that and be disrespectful, but you also wanna know who these people were. We wanna know about our history, what happened, what they stood for before their passing, and why they were so important in the first place. Wache and his family remains were studied and it appears malaria claimed the lives of him and his entire family. This is also the first mummified cub we've ever found in history, so as far as findings go, this one was uh, jam packed, jam packed with history. Number seven. King Tut's artifacts. The new Grand Egyptian Museum was set to open in 2018, and then finally it did come 2021. And while that's quite recent, the contents displayed inside certainly are not. For the first time in history, King Tut's ancient belongings, all of them, all the artifacts discovered with him, will be on display. See, prior to this museum being open, we only saw around 150 artifacts from his tomb. They all took pieces on tour, a big Egyptian mummy tour, you know. It was like Kiss's final reunion tour, and then also King Tut's. You're like, oh, who do I see? Ooh. But now this museum, this grand museum, will house thousands of artifacts. That's over 7,000 square meters as well, might I add. What a display this is. If you have a chance to visit the Grand Egyptian Museum, or if you saw this King Tut world tour, I'm jealous. I'm very jealous. We have one museum in Toronto, but it's, you know. The Egypt section there is... Number six, engraved warnings. 
It's a part three, so of course we have to include some Paris catacomb creepiness. Yeah, as far as the old tombs go, that one's pretty haunting, I'd say, no? These catacombs date back to the late 1700s. Not so ancient, but give me a break, hey? It's part three, I'm doing my best. When the city cemeteries were starting to fill up, and I mean that in a literal sense, officials began moving contents from all over to these abandoned mines. The catacombs were opened officially in 1809. What a fun family excursion that must have been. Nice. That or the wax museum. They're like, mm, let's take the kids this way. Let's go this way. They designed the catacombs with the walls of skulls to ensure that visitors would meditate on death. That's the whole vibe. We go, let's go meditate and think about death for a bit in the walls of skulls. Yeah, I'm sure everybody who visits thinks of nothing else. Pretty confident there. In order to ensure this was the vibe of the room, there's a phrase carved above the entrance, and it translates to, stop, this is the empire of the dead. I, I would be like, stop this, okay, no problem. Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home send signs your mom hangs up in a kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who, as we know, had over 100 kids. So, the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amonhotep III. Amonhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. 
Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chilling in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestor since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al-Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number 9, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone. Pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word, but then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number 8, Khufu's Ship. When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well-preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Cause you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about this stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number 6, Construction Manifest. You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them, you know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. 
It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number five. Necklace from Egyptian Afterlife. We're all curious what happens after you die, right? But nobody celebrates the end of your days like the ancient Egyptians. They go hard, they really, they really go for it. Like I mentioned earlier, they would paint doors, leave valuables, any new tomb we discover has thousands of artifacts, hints rather, to what lies beyond. An ancient necropolis was discovered only a few years ago in, of course, Egypt, and it contains dozens of coffins and a necklace that holds a message from the afterlife. Okay, now we're talking. This site is around 2,000 years old and they're in the process of excavating it right now as we speak. But so far the tombs and artifacts found belong to an ancient priestess. Nice, a message from the afterlife is pretty spectacular. We want that, we want that. Don't let Rose from Titanic near that one or else you know what she'll do with the necklace. You know what she likes doing. Number four, bone compass. Okay, just because we've been talking about graves does not mean these messages or anything have to be written or drawn. Sometimes it can be as simple as leaving animal bones on the ground. Yeah, that ought to speak for itself more than any art. If you see that, you're on your way. I'm not gonna be grave robbing if there's a big old pile of bones oddly placed. What do you guys like, White Walkers, Game of Thrones? What is this, this is terrifying. In St. Augustine, for example, the remains of a donkey were found buried underground. Judging from the skull, it had been clearly hunted down by humans at the time. That's not the weird part here. The weird part is that all these bones have been carefully separated. There's no marks to suggest that any tools were used, so, Gross, for one, but researchers believe that this wasn't even used for food. The limbs were placed to point north and south. They use this donkey as a compass. How rude is that? Donkeys in the area of Florida in the 17th century, that's not bizarre at all. But the way these bones were laid out, something's afoot here. What's the message here? I mean, obviously besides that way's north. Is there any other message of that? Or are people just bored back in the day? Number three, mythical carvings. Back in 2014, a 17-year-old cemetery was discovered along the Silk Road, which are these ancient trout roads, ancient highways rather, connecting China and the Roman Empire. In the city of Kucha, now northwest China, this cemetery was found along with 10 ancient tombs, one of which was referred to as M3. All these tombs get their cool nicknames like KB55, that's pretty good, M3, short, sounds very British, M3, sounds like a British secret agent. M3 didn't have any haunting messages this time around, but it did contain several carvings of mythical creatures. Some creatures that don't even exist. There's a white tiger of the west, the black turtle of the north, the vermilion bird of the south, so far so recognizable, and then there's the azure dragon of the east. Could this mean that dragons are very real, were very real, are? I vote R, please be real. These mythical carvings represent different seasons in the heavens, but what could the other six carvings even mean? Maybe the depictions of hell? Number two, chalk drum. Deemed one of the most important pieces of prehistoric art, this chalk drum is 5,000 years old. It was first discovered by archeologists in England back in 2018. It was found with the remains of three humans. It was featured in the World of Stonehenge exhibition. It sounds like an instrument, but really this chalk drum was used as an art piece. Almost like all of our drum sets from when we grew up. I'm like, oh, we don't actually play that. It's just for show. Yeah, I can't do anything on it. That guitar too, can't play that, just for show. Maybe time of your life, if you're lucky, on a good day, but for the most part, for show. British Museum Project Curator recalls the findings as remarkable, of course. This was the artistic language throughout the British Isles 5,000 years ago. Radiocarbon dates back to 2890 BC, around the same time of the construction of Stonehenge. So yeah, pretty old. A chalk ball and bone pin were also found at the site. So again, pretty loaded discovery. And finally, coming in at number one, Celtic Warrior Shield. This one was referred to as the most important British Celtic art object of the millennium, which not a bad title at all. An Iron Age chariot burial was discovered in Yorkshire a few years ago, and researchers were excavating a house development originally in Pocklington, and then they find a soldier's tomb. <laughs> nice. Also, what's the asking price? The soldier was laid on a chariot with a Celtic shield over top. The shield was dated back to 175 BC. See, most Iron Age shields up until this point didn't have scalloped edges, but this one did. Yeah, we thought metal shields were used only for ceremonies, but this one has been repaired. There are clear sword marks. It had been used many, many times in battles. My arm gets tired in class if I raise it for too long, you know? I have to like do the old switcheroo or like hold it up, one of these. This guy was holding a metal shield up all day long. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna go do a thousand push-ups now and fix that light that I moved when I did that hand bit. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the knife-armed man. 
In 2018, while researchers were excavating a 1,200 to 1,400 year old necropolis in northern Italy, they made a gruesome discovery that led to us learning a super interesting story of someone who lived all those years ago. Inside this necropolis, there were the remains of a man, but what set him apart from the others is that he had a knife blade prosthetic arm. Further analysis of his bones showed that his arm had been removed via blunt force trauma. Normally, all those years ago, the wounds would have killed you, if not from the loss of blood, then from infection because, of course, this was a time before antibiotics, but somehow this man managed to survive it all, and in doing that, he made himself the scariest prosthetic limb I've ever heard of. He replaced his missing hand with a long knife buckled to his arm with leather straps. In our number 9 spot today, we have KV55. This is a tomb that is referred to by a number rather than a name because we don't actually know who lies inside of this tomb. While this tomb had its modern discovery in 1907, we still haven't quite found the answers surrounding this mystery. To make things a little more eerie, while the walls of the actual tomb are bare, which is bizarre, as you walk down the steps towards the tomb, you'll notice there are some markings leading up to it. You'll see inscribed on the wall of the entrance the words which can be translated to, the evil one shall not live again. If this wasn't enough to give an unsettling feeling, the coffin inside of the tomb has been desecrated, with part of the face having been removed. So all in all, we don't know a lot about what's going on down there, but it doesn't seem good. In our number 8 spot today, we have Man E. Okay, so normally when you're out in the field searching for mummies and tombs and all of that sort of archaeological business in Egypt, the containers or vessels that the past people are put in are decorated or contain some sort of drawings or writings. So in 1886, when Gaston Maspero, who was the head of Egyptian antiquities, came across a plain burial box, he was a little intrigued as to what could be inside. This box had no information as to who the person inside may or may not be, but the corpse inside was wrapped in sheepskin, which was apparently considered unclean by the ancient Egyptians. When unwrapped, it was revealed that this person had both their hands and their feet bound, and as he looked towards the face of this person, he found what appeared to be a screaming face looking back at him. Back in 1886, we didn't have the same amount of information as we do now, so of course this quickly freaked researchers out and led to everyone believing that this person must have been tortured to death. How scary that must have been. But luckily, with the things we now know, we have a much less horrific answer, thankfully. If the jaw of a person isn't strapped shut, when a body is mummified, the jaw naturally falls open, thus this horrible screaming expression. The real mystery that remains is how this mummy, who clearly wasn't considered a person of royalty, came to be buried alongside kings and queens. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Black Granite Sarcophagus. In 2018, archaeologists in Egypt found a massive black granite sarcophagus in Alexandria, Egypt that dated all the way back to 2,000 years ago. Rumors immediately started swirling about what this sarcophagus might have contained, but the best way to find out? Well, you have to open it, of course. Instead of some crazy curse being unleashed, the first thing that escaped this tomb when opened was a horrible unbearable smell. Apparently it was so bad that the site had to be evacuated for a while before they could return to finish opening it up. When they finally were able to completely lift the lid, they found a red-brown like sewage water flooding the bottom, which is likely where that horrible smell was coming from. Other than all that gross stuff, inside the sarcophagus were the bones of three people. Unfortunately, the mummies did not end up being well preserved, so only the skeletal remains were still intact. It is believed that the people inside may have been soldiers from the time of pharaohs. This is believed because one of the skulls had a crack in it from an arrow. There was a bust found along with the tomb, but unfortunately, due to time past, it has been weathered beyond recognition. But that is not the only way researchers can find out where the soldiers are from and what time period they lived in. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Inca mummies. In 1976, researchers found two mummies at a burial site in northern Chile. These two corpses belonged to two young women who were the victims of human ritual sacrifice. It is likely that the sacrifice they were a part of was one that was carried out by the Inca to commemorate either historical or political events, or as a response to a natural disaster. The mummies were found wearing silver ornaments, and they were surrounded by ceramic vessels, and they were wearing red robes. The red in the Inca clothing was often created using hematite or other iron oxides, but upon further inspection of these mummies, it was revealed that the 
their red clothing held something much more dangerous. The dye used for their clothing contained cinnabar, which is a mineral rich in mercury. This was often used in the ancient world as a pigment for makeup, clothing, and painting, but handling it leads to mercury poisoning. What is strange is that researchers believe that the toxicity of cinnabar wasn't known in ancient Peru, so we aren't exactly sure why they used it in the first place, but it's thought it might have been used as protection against grave robbers. Number 5. Queen Nefertiti's Disappearance Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced. This family forced fun. She worshipped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion, she was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. There's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KB-19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, uh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QB43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two, baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. Sorry, cat people. The other animals are fun, like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know, anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC, to 10 BC. Yeah, he's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make 
arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research and you finally find this door, this ancient door, you find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there, and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go.